Good morning and welcome to worship at First Baptist Church of Pendleton here on this first Sunday in September, first day of September. We begin a new month and what better place to begin than in worship as we start out this month. Um, Sorry, I'm losing my train of thought this morning. <laughs> Maybe not quite enough coffee. Labor Day, that was what I was going to mention. I know a number are out of town this weekend, but others are here for the weekend. So welcome. It's good to be here together as a church family. If you're joining us online, welcome. We hope you will visit our website, fbcpendleton.org, where you'll find our worship guide and other resources to guide you as we worship together today. Let us go to God in prayer. God, we thank you that you are a God of grace and love. We thank you that you meet us where we are and that you meet us here today. God, remind us of your steadfast, loving presence and help us to learn from you. Help us to lean on you. Help us to receive your grace and to offer it to one another. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Come Sunday morning, isn't it good that we prepare ourselves for worship and stillness and just listen while the candles are lighted to remind us of the presence of the Holy Spirit with us. And we remember the words of assurance that Jesus gave his disciples. Let not your hearts be troubled. Set them at rest and trust him. Peace was Jesus' parting gift, his abiding gift to all who trust him. And let us, by faith, find that peace in our own hearts and having it, share with one another the wishful greeting printed in your worship guide. Peace be with you. hymn is number 627 in your hymnal. Would you stand together as we sing?
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7. I'll be reading a few selected verses, verses 1 through 8, then 14 and 15, and then 21 through 23. So this is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands. That is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the traditions of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, the people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. you there? Ah, there we go. Well, thank you all for for being here. Thank you for coming down so that I'm not up here by myself. I want to say good morning to to anybody that might watch us from home or from uh, the video later. I'm very glad that you're here. Um, So what I wanted to talk to you this morning was about clean hands and clean hearts. In the scripture that we were just hearing, Jesus was talking about that. Um, He was talking about what cleans your hands and also what cleans your heart. And um, on the front of our bulletin this day, um, there's a scripture passage, and I forgot to bring my bulletin up here with me, but Jennifer's bringing one. Thank you. Um, Right here on the front of it, it says, create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a right spirit within me. So, if we want to clean our hands, what do we do? How do you clean your hands? Caleb, you can answer if you want to, too. What'd you say? Okay, so we can use water, or this is hand sanitizer. Have you ever used that to clean your hands? What about soap and water? Yeah, we can use that to clean our hands. Um, What do you use to clean our hearts? Any idea? We can't really get our hearts and wash them with soap and water or even hand sanitizer. Well, Jesus said that um, in the scripture passage today, Jesus said that what gets our hearts dirty is the things that we do and the way that we treat people. So what gets our hands dirty is when we touch something that's dirty, right? When we touch dirt or mud or anything that's dirty and sticks to our hands. But what makes our hearts dirty is when we um, forget to love God and forget to love our neighbor. So if you 
treat somebody uh, and you're mean to them, or if you act like other people aren't as good as you are. Um, any ways that we're, that we're mean and that we're hurtful and that we're not loving, those are the things that make our hearts dirty. And to clean those, the scripture says, create in me a clean heart, O God. So to clean our heart, we need God's help. And we need God um, through Jesus to forgive us and help us be clean again and help us learn to love like he loves. So today, and Caleb, if you want to come up here for this part, you can, but you don't have to. Um, but today, I want us to just get a little bit of sanitizer. I'm going to put a little sanitizer in your hands. And as once we all have the sanitizer, then we're going to put the sanitizer in our hands, but we're going to say a prayer out loud. We're going to say, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Okay, so let's practice that. Can you all say that out loud with me? Say, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Can you say that? Can you say, create in me a clean heart? Good. Um, congregation, will you all practice saying that with us one time too? And encourage our kids? A clean heart, O oh God. Good. All right, so we're practiced. Now, come get your sanitizer. Now, as you're going back to your seats, let's, you keep playing. Um, this is a little sanitizer you can take with you to remember that God helps make us clean. Okay. We're going to continue in that spirit of praying that God would create in us a clean heart. This is an old chorus. The words are printed in your worship guide. Um, I will sing it. If you know it, you are uh, encouraged to sing along. But whether you know it or not, uh, let me encourage you to pray this prayer with me as we continue to worship. Ask me not. 
for our next hymn. It's number 587, Amazing Grace. Would you sing together? Amazing Grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It was great. seated. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, you are faithful in your word, and you are the source of our strength, our courage, and our wisdom in times of our most essential being and need. It is by your grace that we are sustained. Your word is our guide, and by our faith in Christ, we are at peace. Bless the gifts we bring to support the ministry here and in our community. Lead us to be faithful stewards. Guide us in the use of our resources and our offerings that they may be used favorably in your sight and extend to everyone the embrace of your love 
in this serving ministry. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. <coughs> Doxology.
have heard and been reminded of what the Lord requires of us to seek justice and love, kindness, and walk humbly. A couple of weeks ago, we had the opportunity to host our neighbors from King's Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church for supper on Saturday evening. About a year ago, we started having conversation with their church about a partnership between our two churches, hoping to engage around ideas related to racial justice. And this event, this Saturday evening supper, was an opportunity for us to practice some of that in conversation and communication with one another to build relationships and trust together. Now, this was something new and different. We have done a lot of meals here, but we hadn't done an event quite like that. So there were a lot of details to figure out. I thought we had everything lined up. We knew what we were doing for the chicken. We knew what we were doing for people bringing things. And then the Wednesday night before, three people asked me, who is in charge of this event? And I realized there's a lot more than the food that goes into this type of event. There were a lot of other questions. Even though we had the food sorted out, there were a lot of other concerns. Well, who's going to move the tables? Who's going to make the tea? Who's going to tell people where to go when they get here if they haven't been here before? There is a lot more involved in hosting a supper than just the food. Of course, the food is a pretty central part of the event, but there is more details about which to be concerned. For the past few Sundays, our sermon series, Soul Food, has invited us to reflect on images and metaphors from scripture about food. In today's passage from Mark chapter 7, it is right in between two other food dilemmas that have come up in Mark's gospel. In Mark chapter 6, and then again in Mark chapter 8, Jesus finds himself in the midst of a bunch of hungry people. While we had tables full of food for our supper the other week, they did not have enough food. They had not, did not have the food all figured out. That was a pretty important detail that was missing. Thousands of people had come to hear Jesus' teaching, but they only had a few loaves of bread and some small fish. Perhaps some of them were asking, who's in charge here? Unlike our feast, they were having a shortage of food. But in both instances, in Mark chapter 6 and Mark chapter 8, Jesus feeds the multitude, providing an abundance of food from that which is shared. And it is in between these two stories of miraculous feedings that we find our passage for today, Mark chapter 7. In this passage, Jesus is presented with another food eating related dilemma, but this one is not actually about the food. It's about some of those other details that go into eating. Some of the religious leaders have come to Jesus with a question, or perhaps more of a challenge. Why, they want to know, are your disciples not living according to the rules handed down by the elders, but they eat with hands that are ritually unclean? Now, just as there is more to a meal than just the food, there is more to this question than hygiene. A bottle of hand sanitizer would not have resolved the Pharisees' concerns. Instead, the key words of this question are not unclean hands, but rather the rules handed down by the elders. That is what they are concerned about. The disciples are not following the rules. This is not the only time in the Gospels that we find the religious leaders trying to catch Jesus doing something unlawful. This seems to have been a strategy of choice for those who wish to undermine Jesus. If they could prove that he was not following the law that God had given them, through Moses, then that could shed some doubt on his claim that he was sent by God. And this claim of Jesus that he was sent by God is disrupting everything. It's disrupting their whole religious system. So if they can prove, well, we know that God sent us these laws through Moses. This man's not following those laws, so therefore he can't be from God. That was their hope. That was what they were trying to prove. But Jesus is not rejecting the traditions of the elders. He's not rejecting the law that was passed down, but he is also not letting those traditions get in the way of what God is calling him to do. 
Jesus will not let the traditions, the laws, the God-given directives get in the way of what God is calling him to do. Traditions can be powerful. They have a powerful influence on us and on our practices. I read a story about a church in Denmark where the worshipers bowed regularly before a spot on the wall. They'd been doing that for three centuries. Generation after generation had taught their children and they continued to bow before that spot on the wall. And nobody remembered why they were doing that. Nobody could explain it, but they'd done it for 300 years, so they were going to keep doing it. But one day in renovating the church, they removed some of the whitewash from that section of the wall. And at the exact spot where people had been bowing for all of those years, there was the image of the Madonna. At one time, that was what they were bowing to. But then, even when it was covered up for three centuries, people still bowed. That is the power of tradition. Tradition can become so ingrained in us that it's so ritualized, so part of us, that we continue to do it even when some of the meaning has been lost. Jesus shows us that sometimes even tradition that was meant to help us follow God can actually get in the way of following God. This seems to be what was happening with the Pharisees. They were trying to do the right thing, or at least they seemed to be, but Jesus did not always do what they thought was the right thing. Yet he clearly had God's power and blessing for how else would he be able to perform such miracles and give such wise teachings. When what Jesus did and said did not line up precisely with their traditional understanding of God and God's expectations and desires for people, what they choose, what they fight for, is their tradition. They have Jesus doing something new and different, and they have the tradition they have always known. And even though Jesus clearly has God's power with him, they go back to that familiar tradition. Tradition is powerful. In the past, that tradition has brought them close to God. They don't want to let go of it. 2,000 plus years later, it is easy for us, I think, to criticize the Pharisees for being such rule followers. They are unable to see this new thing that God is doing through Jesus. Why are they so worried about washing hands and what people do or don't do on the Sabbath? And yet... When have we allowed our traditions to take precedence over what God might be calling us to do? When have we prioritized what has made us feel close to God over something new that might help someone feel close to God who has always felt outside of God's circle? We know God is more than these traditions, and yet sometimes we let these traditions stand in the way of God. Jesus tells the Pharisees they're paying too much attention to what's on the outside, on what comes into the body from the outside. They need to pay more attention, Jesus says, to what's on the inside, to what comes out of them. Jesus' words to them are harsh. He calls them hypocrites, and he quotes scripture against them, perhaps as a reminder that he does, in fact, know the scriptures. He is familiar with these traditions of the elders that they are accusing him of ignoring. He knows them, but he also knows God in a different way, in a deeper way. He knows these traditions, but they are missing the point of those traditions. In verse 14, Jesus says, Nothing outside of a person can enter and contaminate the person in God's sight. Rather, the things that come out of a person contaminate the person. What makes you impure, Jesus says, is not what goes into you from the outside, but what comes out of you from the inside. It is the fruit of your life, the result of the faith you are living. That is what shows the state of your heart. The epistle of James in chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, puts it like this. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this. To care for orphans and widows in their distress 
and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Too often, we assume that the outside matches the inside. Now, the outside is often a reflection of the inside, but it is also possible to clean up the outside without cleaning up the inside. That seems to be the tendency of the Pharisees, and perhaps ours as well. Author Anne Lamott wrote a book entitled Almost Everything, Notes on Hope. In chapter 3, Humans 101, she writes this, Almost everyone is screwed up, broken, clingy, scared, and yet designed for joy. Even, or especially people who seem to have it more or less together, are more like the rest of us than you would believe. I try not to compare my insides to their outsides because this makes me worse than I already am. As we develop love, appreciation, and forgiveness for others over time, we may accidentally develop these things for ourselves as well. How often do we compare our insides to someone else's outsides? We scroll through social media and we think other people's lives are surely happier, more joy-filled, less stressful than our own. I will admit to having done this. I will also admit to having carefully staged a picture before posting it to remove the clutter and mess out of the picture. During the height of the pandemic a few years ago when we were filming worship from home, I remember one day clearing off one half of the dining room table so that I could sit there to record a Bible study. The other half of the table was out of view of the camera because it was piled with children's projects and art supplies and homework and mail and books and who knows all kinds of other things. I did not want that clutter to distract the message of the Bible study. And yet, we all have that clutter. It may be off camera, but we all have that mess. Sometimes we can remove it from view, but it is still there. Sometimes we compare our insides to someone else's outsides. We're not getting the full picture. We're not seeing the off camera mess. But other times, we compare our outsides to someone else's insides. And this seems to be what the Pharisees were doing. They had cleaned up their outsides, but they were looking at other people's insides. They were seeing the mess in other people's lives and not admitting the mess in their own. Perhaps the clutter of someone else's life is more difficult to hide from the view of the camera. We present the cleaned up version of our own lives. We see someone else's struggles. And we think, well, we're doing better somehow. We're practicing faith more closely. We're more obedient. But remember the words that Jesus quoted from the prophet Isaiah. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. Where are our hearts? Are we feeling worried and guilty about the imperfections of our lives? Are we comparing our lives to someone else's cleaned up outside version? Or are we overlooking our own imperfections and focusing on someone else's imperfections? Are we cleaning up our outsides and then comparing our polished version to someone else's struggles? God sees our hearts. God sees what's on the inside. Rather than focusing on cleaning up the outside, Jesus reminds us to clean up the inside. Make our hearts pure. This is something we cannot do on our own or by force of will, but it is something God can do in us. As the psalmist proclaims, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Our hands may be dirty. Our lives may be a bit messy. We are imperfect humans. But God looks at our hearts. May we allow God to cleanse our hearts. Let us pray. God, we bring you all of ourselves today. We bring you our lives and all the mess within it. We bring you our hearts. And you know what is in our hearts. We pray, God, that you would forgive us for where we have fallen short. Forgive us for where we have failed to do what you would have us to do. Forgive us when we have done what we know we should not do. God, forgive us 
for our imperfections. We know, God, that you receive us and welcome us, even in our mess, even with dirty hands and messy lives. God, we know that you love us. And so help us this day to receive your love, to allow your love to wash over us and cleanse us. Create in us clean hearts, O oh God. Help us to live out of the abundance that you have given us, the abundance of grace, not the worry that we are not enough or that your grace is not enough to cover our sins, but help us to trust in your abundant, amazing grace. And God, help us to offer that grace to others as well. Remind us that we too have imperfections, we too fall short, and help us to offer the grace to others that we so desperately need from you. We thank you, God, for these gifts, these good and perfect gifts of grace and forgiveness of lo and love. We thank you, God, that you pour out these gifts on us as you shine down on us. Help us, God, to live in your light, to cleanse our hearts, and to allow our spirits to be renewed. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of response this morning is Love Lifted Me, hymn number 618. As we sing our hymn of response, I will be here at the altar table. I would welcome the opportunity to hear from you. Perhaps you'd like to come and pray with me. Perhaps you'd like to come and share a decision that God has placed on your heart. As we sing, may we respond as God leads, Love Lifted Me, hymn 618. Would you stand together? I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Despairing cry from the waters lifted me. Now safe am I. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me.
let me invite you to be seated for just a moment. And if you would look in your insert in the announcements of your bulletin, there are some opportunities coming up for this week. If you're online, this is available on our website as well. I hope you will join us tonight at 5 o'clock for our ice cream social. We'll be in the fellowship hall. Uh, several of our deacons are making homemade ice cream. We'll have some other uh, treats as well. So I hope you can join us at 5 o'clock. This is a uh, just a social event to enjoy this together and enjoy being together together as a community. Um, and then also note that the church office is closed tomorrow for Labor Day, and our office manager, Joe Reed, is also out the rest of the week as well. He's on vacation this week, so be aware we may be a little slower with returning calls, uh, but we'll still uh, have the office open and be checking messages and all of that. Uh, Tuesday through Thursday, the office will be closed on Friday since Joe will be on vacation. Uh, but be sure to look at some of the other announcements and opportunities. Uh, remember, our staff evaluation process is on going. That goes through Wednesday of this week. Uh, you can fill that out online. There's also some handouts on the table outside the church office if you prefer to use the paper version. And then our Wednesday night Bible study is continuing um, and other announcements and opportunities are listed here as well. Anything else we need to mention? All right. Uh, let me invite you to hear now this word of benediction. Depart now in the fellowship of God the Father. Remembering as we go, by the goodness of God, you have been brought into this world. By the grace of God, you have been kept all the day long, even until this very hour. And by the love of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus, you are being redeemed. Amen. <laughs>